Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University where the Sahai Weisui Collaborative Project is based. Today we want to welcome everyone to our fourth lecture of the 2023-2024 academic year. We're hosting Professor Li Chen Yang from Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. Um, and we have a really great lineup of scholars. Um, they're great because they know each other. So <laughs> this is really nice, right? And they're all kind of friends. Um, and then they're all just great scholars in and of themselves. Um, and they've all participated in other events for Sahai Weisui. So um, thank you guys all for <laughs> making this possible and really um, supporting these events, right? And then having them be whatever, sort of high caliber and very congenial. This is really something special and that's what we're trying to do with Sahai Weisui. So um, I really wanna thank you guys. Uh, our commentators are Professor Stephen Engel from Wesleyan University. Professor Nipei Ming from Grand Valley State University, and Professor Sidney Morrow from the University of Central Oklahoma. And we also have Sai Ying Ning, and I don't know if you're saying your last name really correctly, um, from the Sydney University of New York, and she's gonna serve as the chair for this event. Um, so, and again, I just wanna thank everyone invited and everyone in the audience for making this event possible. The topic of Professor Li Chen Yang's lecture is a Confucian principle of progressive humanity. Um, and this is his new book uh, that just came out. Did it already come out this year or is it coming out? Okay, yeah, that already came out, yeah. Um, so the structure of the event is as follows. Um, Sai Ying will introduce Professor Li Chen Yang and then Professor Li Chen Yang will give his talk. Um, then we have comments from three commentators. So normally we would do comments from one commentator and then have discussion with the commentator and the speaker. And then we go to the next, next like this. Um, so, uh, and, and Sai Ying will chair this event. Um, so she'll introduce each speaker uh, as it's their turn. Then they'll have the discussion. And then at the end, um, she can provide her own comments and then we can open the floor uh, to the audience. The event will end promptly at 10.30 a.m. Beijing time. That's just about, uh, just under 90 minutes from now. So before getting things started and handing them over to Sai Ying, I just want to say a few words about the Sahai Weisui Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sahai Weisui Collaborative Learning project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in other forms of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all time types of aggressive, look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes in academic exchanges. The Sahai Weisui Collaborative Learning Project hopes to seek uh, or accomplish these types of shifts in orientation during academic exchange by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. Um, we hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. Um, and I think that this will be probably one of our best <laughs> events in terms of um, aligning with the spirit of collaborative learning Sakai Waysphere project because of the people involved today. So again, I really want to thank everyone for coming. Um, before introducing our chair, I also want to thank Professor Lee. Uh, he probably, I'm sure he doesn't know this actually, but we had this um, conference on harmony a few years ago. I want to say in 2017 or 18. Um, yeah. yeah, so... You invited me to this conference, and during this conference, I had discussions with, I mean, the topic of the conference is very much, it was on harmony, right? So it's very much something we're interested in the Sahai Weisui project. But also I had discussions with other scholars there about other ways to um, per, to sort of uh, discuss with people, right? Or to, to conduct academic exchange. And so 
a lot of the sort of seeds of this project were born at your conference. So um, thank you very much for, for that opportunity. So um, I'm going to hand things over to our chair, Saying. Um, she's currently a philosophy graduate student at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, um, where she works primarily on issues that arise at the intersection of ancient epistemology and philosophy of language and logic. Her research aims to highlight the importance of attending to cultural conventions in any philosophic or semantic investigation into truth and ethical knowledge. This motivates her interest in cross-cultural philosophy more generally and Chinese philosophy specifically. So Saying has two forthcoming papers actually, both in philosophy East and West. Um, one is A Tale of Two Owens, Xiao as trusting others to know who you are. And the other is Relational Normativity, Williams's thick ethical conceptions in Confucian ethical communities. So thank you very much, Saying. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, so I am very happy to be here to be introducing Professor Li Chen Yang. Um, I've never met you in person, but I have read a lot of your works over um, the years, and I'm really excited to meet you in person when I'm hopefully back in Singapore soon. Um, so as everybody knows, uh, Professor Lee is the professor of philosophy at Nanyang Technological University, which is NTU in Singapore. Um, I found out recently that he actually founded the philosophy program there. And I have a lot of friends who attended NTU and they speak very highly of you as a professor and a, and a, a teacher. Um, Professor Lee has um, extensive bibliography with over 10 books and over 100 articles and book chapters and all in top philosophy journals. Um, I think um, a lot of people know you for your work on harmony. Uh, my personal favorite, I think, paper of yours is Lee as Cultural Grammar that really sort of um, cemented like a, a lot of my understanding of Confucian philosophy and Confucian and the thought uh, the thought in Confucian in the Confucian tradition. Um, so um, Professor Lee uh, is, you know, has has is his work extensively in Chinese philosophy, but also in comparative philosophy. And I think um, in a way that I think it's, it's very um, exciting for a grad student like me to in, in a field that seems to be still developing and figuring out his methodology. Um, his work has been very influential to the development of what comparative philosophy is and can be. Um, so I think that's, that's exciting. Um, and I don't want to take up more time. Um, so I'm going to let um, Professor Lee take over. Um, I do want to say since we have three commentators, maybe I should sort of make a note um, to cut you off at 60 minutes, because if not, um, I don't think we'll get through all three. Um, so that's the only hard deadline I have. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Sai Ying, uh, for the introduction and for chairing. And uh, thanks to Paul for organizing this and for uh, my commentators, and participants and joining me today. Um, uh, you know, uh, Scholarship is a collaborative, uh, as the title of our series suggests. Uh, over the years, I have learned a lot uh, from many people, uh, including, of course, Pei Min, Steve, and more recently, Paul's work. So um, uh, today, I hope I will get a feedback from you so that it will help me uh, learn better. Uh, I will uh, share my screen and then uh, I will try not to take too much time. So we leave enough time for comments and uh, discussion. Let me share screen. Okay, do you see my shared screen? Okay. All right. So uh, the uh, the topic of uh, today's uh, talk is uh, <laughs> the principle of progressive humanity uh, approach to studying Confucianism. Uh, here, I want to propose a principle that can be widely used as we study Confucianism in contemporary time. Uh, my talk has a, a three uh, components. The first, I want to make a point that what Confucianism is to me 
a lot of ion beta hydrogen work. The second part is the uh, discussion of two different approaches to studying confusion. And then finally, I uh, elaborate the idea of a principle of progressive humanity. Now, the first part, I won't take much time. Um, since I do research mostly in the English-speaking world, I think um, people who are not specialists uh, in Confucianism often make a too close connection between Confucius, the historical thinker on the one hand, and the Confucianism on the other. Uh, personally, I think there is a clear, you know, uh, evidently a close connection, uh, but uh, we cannot make it too close, too much a connection there. And Confucius is just one major thinker in the tradition, and the tradition is evolving. It's, uh, it's evolving, and um, and also in the ancient time, uh, Confucianism is grown from a variety of texts and thinkers. Uh, so it's not. Uh, is not Confucius, and you can argue that a large part of ancient Confucianism is not from Confucius' work, from the analects. So in that regard, it would be misleading and standing to take Confucianism as a similar parallel to Aristotelianism, for example, where the latter is pretty much about Aristotle, and Confucianism is not pretty much about Confucius. You know, my friend can debate on, on, with me on that, but that may be. Uh, historically, uh, when we study Confucianism, uh, we rely on the so-called 13 cl classics. Uh, and also, uh, more recent uh, decades, the work of Xunzi, arguably the number three ancient thinker in the Confucian tradition. All these uh, are making important uh, in the, in the, are important parts of Confucianism. And uh, uh, to be frank, the texts are not always consistent. So often you have to decide which one you agree with within Confucianism, or, th or you know, things said by Confucian thinkers. Uh, and also it's important to understand Confucianism as a development in a developmental uh, development developing idea, tradition. And um, so when we talk about Confucians, often people have different ideas and uh, some refer to ancient text, even the historical figure of Confucius. And some of us think uh, more of a contemporary state of Confucianism. Uh, Steve's work, for example, has a focus more on contemporary, even though he draws a lot from ancient time, but he wants to present uh, Confucianism more of a kind of a contemporary version of Confucianism. In that regard, I, uh, I kind of in agreement with uh, Steve. And Pei also have done similar work in that regard. Uh, now, <laughs> Confucianism, as I understand, I think today for scholars of Confucianism, it is important for us to recognize the fallibility of Confucianism and the fallibility of Confucian, ancient Confucian thinkers. We should not take whatever they said as the eternal truth and to defend it at all cost. And in that regard, the fallibility of Confucianism and the Confucian thinkers makes a major difference, marks a major difference between Confucianism on the one hand and uh, some monotheistic traditions in the West, on the other hand. So in the Bible, for example, even though my Christian friends no longer agree with many things the Bible says, but they usually do not say the Bible is wrong in certain ways. Uh, because, you know, presumably the Bible is the words of God. You cannot say God is wrong. And I think Confucianism in that regard is very different. Confucianism can be mistaken and the Confucian thinkers can be mistaken. And in my view, Confucius himself can be mistaken. And that's important for Confucianism to be alive today, to be stay relevant 
for contemporary times. And that's the first part. The second part is of my talk is on uh, two different <laughs> approaches, <laughs> historical approach and the philosophical approaches. <clears throat> on this point, I draw from Richard Rorty's work. Rorty articulated two kinds of reconstructions in philosophy. One he called a historical reconstruction, another he called a rational reconstruction. Now, historical reconstruction, according to Rorty, treats the history of philosophy as we treat the history of science. In doing so, we recreate the intellectual scene in which the dead live their lives. In particular, the real and imagined conversations they might have had with their contemporaries or near contemporaries. <clears throat> it's about what has happened, or what might have happened in history. In rational construction, reconstruction, on the other hand, we bring past the thinkers into conversation with ourselves. We want to know how, not only what the past, past the thinker said or would have said, given the limitations of his or her time. We also want to know what an ideally reasonable and educatable past the thinker would it be broad to accept as possible, as reasonable? So for Rorty, given that what we know about things in the world and what we know of the overall orientation of past thinkers, what we believe the thinker could say on a matter of inquiry today. So in rational reconstruction, an ideal Aristotle, this is in Rorty's word, can be brought to describe himself as having mistaken the preparatory taxonomic stages of biological research for the essence of all scientific inquiry. We are, in rational construct reconstruction, we are not dealing with the past thinkers as they once lived. We are instead dealing with the re-educated dead that is, we imagine, you know, ancient thinkers were living today, given their overall philosophical orientation, what they would think and what they would say. I will come back to this example later on. <clears throat> so ideally, for Rorty, historical reconstructions are ones on which all historians could agree. And if we all know all the historical fact, if we have you know, um, solid, sound academic training, we do our work right, then we should reach a, a, the same conclusion. In fact, we may not when we do history, but that means uh, just we miss some information or make a mistake in our reasoning. Uh, but if you have all the information, uh, you should agree on the conclusion. One example is, uh, uh, in Chinese philosophy, in Confucianism is Xunzi's Wu Xing. For a long time, scholars were not sure what Wu Xing was. I mean, what Wu Xing uh, Xunzi was referring to. Because the Wu Xing the term usually in the past was closely associated with Jin Mu Shui Huo Tu, the five processes. And uh, now, after we discovered the uh, ancient text, I think a few decades ago, the Wu Xing text, we are clear the Wu Xing then referred to Ren Yi Li Zhi Sheng. Now the debate is over. History uh, historians of Confucian text agree for Xunzi, Wu Xing is Ren Yi Li Zhi Sheng, not Yi Mu Shui Tu. And that is consistent with the context of Xunzi's discussion. The rational reconstruction for Rorty are unlikely to converge. There is no reason why they should. Now this is because the reasonable people can disagree on whether it is reasonable to expect quote, an ideally reasonable and educated past thinker to change his or her view. 
On some issues, even an ideally reasonable and educatable path the thinker may nevertheless choose an undetermined path. Now, to me, this is basically <clears throat> philosophy. And in philosophy, we disagree. That's the nature of philosophy, right? It's not empirical science. And, uh, uh, you know, when uh, two philosophers disagree, it's a possible both are reasonable and uh, well-informed. They just have a different perspective. So in the book, uh, I'm, uh, I don't publish it. <laughs> Instead of talking about rational reconstruction as Rorty used the term, I use the philosophical reconstruction, mainly referring to the two disciplines involved here. One is the history, historians of Confucianism, another is a philosopher of Confucianism. So uh, my philosophical reconstruction is parallel or basically the same uh, as the rational reconstruction in uh, logic's work. So in a historical uh, approach, we deal with un-re-educated un ancient thinkers, the way they were. In uh, philosophical reconstruction, we deal with uh, re-educated ancient thinkers. We imagine they are alive today and are informed with what we know today. Uh, for example, uh, if you uh, think about uh, Confucius, uh, the un-re-educated Confucius, I would say men and women are un unequal. Uh, a re-educated Confucius today might say that the two sexes are equal. I think that's the difference between historical approach and uh, philo philosophical approach. So the difference here is uh, you can make a, an analogy <laughs> about reconstructing an ancient house. Imagine there's a valuable ancient house uh, that has a very good cultural significance, uh, but it's run down, we needed to reconstruct it. If you go with a pure historical approach, you would want to reconstruct the way it was, as close as possible to what it was, even though uh, as remarkable as the house was designed, the designer might have some flaws or defects in, in the design. And uh, there may be some problem with it. But if you are truthful to history, you want to re reconstruct the way it was as close as possible. Now, philosophical, uh, so the, the purpose of such approach is to maximize historical accuracy. And in philosophy, we talk about a textual exactitude. Philosophical approach, on the other hand, is more thinking about its plausibility. We want to reconstruct the Confucianism today, drawing from a variety of sources in the tradition. The one we identify as plausible today, reconstruct a contemporary version of Confucianism. If this ancient house had a defect, then in that analogy, we uh, amend it. For example, uh, the ancient house, uh, if have, you know, uh, uh, well, think about it. today, we would uh, want to have air conditioning in it, you know, running water in it. Ancient time, they did not have it. But if we wanted to reconstruct this, this thing for contemporary uh, use and display. We may want to add these features, even though they are not truthful to the historical house. Now, uh, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. I think both approaches are valuable. Both approaches are important. And in studying Confucianism, we need both. But each researcher may uh, emphasize one or another, or even try to balance the two. Nevertheless, these are two different approaches. We need to be clear about that. 
And uh, this is the view I have been uh, repeating over the years. Uh, for those who do Confucianism, study Confucianism philosophically, we should avoid historicizing Confucianism. We should not take a Confucian studies, study of Confucianism merely as a historical approach, merely a study of history of Confucianism. And in this regard, uh, you can uh, see from time to time, people misunderstand what the philosophers do. They say, well, you know, you see Confucianism now can embrace democracy. That's not true because the Confucians did not. Well, Confucius surely did not. But that does not mean today Confucianism cannot. So if you take Confucianism merely as it once was in ancient time, you miss uh, the point of studying Confucianism philosophically today. And this is what I just said. I think uh, often you will hear criticism uh, of uh, philosophical study of Confucianism, uh, largely because uh, these thinkers do not uh, understand what the philosophers are doing. So there should be good uh, mutual understanding and good collaboration between the two approaches and a good you know, uh, utilization of both uh, for different purposes. Now I move on to the last part of my talk. <clears throat> is uh, my proposal of the principle of progressive Confucianism. Uh, with the, the principle of progressive, uh, uh, sorry, progressive humanity. With the principle of progressive humanity, we understand humanity in a progressive process of human society. And we understand the thinkers as also evolving along with the progress of human society. I will elaborate on this. So when we study uh, philosophy, often we talk about it you know, uh, two principles. This first one is the principle of charity. The second is the principle of humanity. Now the principle of charity is the idea that in, it, it requires interpreting a speaker's statements in the most rational way possible. And in the case of any uh, argument considering is the best, strongest possible interpretation. We don't distort our opponent's view. We try to make it as, you know, as far as reasonable, make the argument of our opponents as plausible, rational as possible. possible. And uh, uh, this is important. Um, I think um, uh, today most people, uh, I think it do well with this principle. Uh, I, when I think about the principle, I recall uh, my youth uh, when I first encountered Confucianism in text. Now it was during the Cultural Revolution. We are all in this Pilin uh, Pico movement, criticizing Confucius movement. And uh, you see all these articles criticizing Confucianism. Uh, most of those articles basically distorts what, distorted what the Confucius said and uh, take it out of a context to make it as worse as possible, as unreasonable as possible. Then you uh, criticize it. And that's the utter violation of this principle. So today, uh, I think it, uh, people mostly observe this principle, but it's a good thing. The second principle is the principle of humanity. Principle of humanity requires us to make a sense of an idea or a text by attributing to the idea holder the propositional attitudes one supposed one would have oneself in those circumstances. Uh, this is a quote from Dennett. <clears throat> Uh, 
I think then I call this is a kind of projective principle. You project yourself in the historical environment and think that uh, what you would think if you were in that uh, environment. Uh, so applying this principle, uh, even though we uh, do not agree with someone's view, we can imagine that had we been in a similar community surrounded by a similar environment, uh, we ourselves would have held such a view. For example, uh, in studying Confucianism, uh, you know, uh, many people have criticized ancient thinkers, Confucian thinkers, as being uh, sexist. Um, then uh, some scholars trying to defend that by reinterpreting ancient texts to say that actually Confucius was not sexist. Uh, I think if you apply to the principle of humanity, uh, I think it's quite understandable that ancient thinkers uh, were mostly likely and mostly uh, sexist. If I were uh, living, uh, you know, two, over two thousand years ago, I observed society and see women were confined to home and only uh, did a house chores within home. And they did not know much about the outside world. They did not go out for business. And they were not educated. Uh, I would have from the view that women were inferior to men. I think that's natural. Uh, we are human and we are limited by our environment. Uh, that does not mean we agree with ancient thinkers, but we can understand that's the view they draw from their experience, from what they know of other, of other things of their time. Now I move on to the principle of progressive humanity. <clears throat> This is an enhanced principle of principle of humanity. On this principle, we should not only make a sense of ancient thinkers by placing them under their own historical circumstances as prescribed by the principle of humanity, but also expand their ideas on the basis of their overall philosophical dispositions in accordance with our modern, modern sensibilities. That is, from an ancient thinker's general attitude and a philosophical framework, we propose new views that someone sharing such attitude and framework may come to hold under modern circumstances. So the idea is, uh, in the principle of humanity is a primarily uh, kind of a, a retroactive a backward approach. You understand a person's uh, historical background and understand what they have formed, why they have formed certain views. It can be applied uh, to contemporary times. You can imagine uh, people in certain countries uh, will form certain views. That if we, uh, I were living in a certain country without adequate information and uh, only uh, were exposed to the things that uh, others there are exposed to, I would have embraced a similar view. Uh, that's the principle of humanity. Now, the principle of progressive humanity is more of a, a forward-looking and projective view. The idea that uh, we think ancient thinkers would agree with us if they were alive today and given their overall philosophical orientation. Now, this is an example. <clears throat> Amish's approach to Renzhen, which I translate as a caring government. Uh, in that, <laughs> Amish basically uh, had two ideas. Why is good rulers should adopt the philosophy of religion? And that's why he 
went around different states trying to persuade the rulers to agree with him that if you are a ruler, it's good for the people and good for you as a ruler to be Ren, to practice carry government. And that is, you know, the best measures was hoping for. Uh, if that does not work, in extreme cases, um, if a despot refuses to do so, and uh, is a very brutal and a cruel ruler, uh, then what people can do? Uh, Mention said in that case, people can overthrow the ruler for a better one, even though by killing him, by killing him. Um, uh, in ancient time, killing the ruler, Shi Jun, is supposed to be highly immoral. And Mention said in that case, it's not a Shi Jun, it's just, just like kill, you know, another person. Not to mention it's a bad person, right? So for Mention at that time, uh, from his perspective, these are two uh, alternatives uh, that could exist. <clears throat> now, if we take a historical approach, I mentioned sure it was clearly not for democracy, even though he did hold the view that the people are the most important uh, in, this, in, the, in the country. And uh, some friends, uh, I think nowadays uh, very few people still hold the view. Uh, Twenty years ago, you would see articles arguing that uh, measures was uh, for democracy. Uh, historically, measures was not. Minben, uh, the idea of people as the foundation, as the basis, is not the same as democracy. But you, you take a philosophical approach. You imagine the measures lives today, given his view on people as the most important, and given his view that a bad ruler should be replaced, would he accept democracy as a better alternative to revolution, which can be bloody, violent? I think it's reasonable to think Mencius would. And uh, Mencius, if Mencius today realize, oh, there is a better way, you know, there is a way, a third approach, instead of getting, uh, luckily getting a good ruler uh, who practiced the regime, uh, or, you know, through a bloody violent revolution to replace the ruler, we can go through democracy to change the ruler for a better one. And better yet, we can use democracy to, Put the pressure on ruler because they, before they become really bad. So in another way, I think today you can argue that uh, uh, measures would agree with democracy. It's not a historical measures view, but you can say kind of a mention view today. A mention approach would lead to the idea that democracy is good. So that is application of progressive humanity. Now, uh, a similar argument with some other thinkers may not be as effective. You think about the Shangyang and the Han Feiz, for example, given their overall philosophical orientation, it is definitely less plausible to argue they would, give, if they carry most of their you know, philosophical beliefs, they would embrace democracy. In comparison, measures would. So if we talk about it, contemporary Confucianism, in order to be Confucianism, to be uh, for Confucianism to be relevant today, we need to uh, use a uh, uh, fallibility idea of Confucianism to reform certain historical views of Confucianism and to inject new ideas into Confucianism. So, so make Confucianism renewed and alive. And that is the purpose of the principle of progressive humanity.
Okay, let me wrap it up. <clears throat> Here is, and Paul said there is no self-promotion. Sorry about that. There is a little self-promotion here. This is the book I, where I try to uh, use this principle. I hope Paul will forgive me because after all, this is relevant to the topic. So in the, in this book, I um, uh, discussed 12 concepts in Confucianism. The Confucian philosophy work, uh, books on Confucianism today, usually fall into one of the two categories. One is the uh, research monograph or research edit the volumes on a specific topic. Those books usually have uh, academic scholarly depth in research, but they do not, they focus on certain areas, a small area sometimes, without the goal of giving a general picture of Confucianism. This is one type of books on Confucianism today. Another type is general introduction to Confucianism. We have, you know, many books of those. Those books usually give a relatively comprehensive view of Confucianism, uh, give people an idea of what you know, Confucianism is, but they you typically do not go into depth with the scholarly research on specific topics. Now in this book, I try to do both. The 12 chapters, each chapter can be read as an independent research article. So each chapter I try to present something new on the topic, whether on Tai He or on Ren, Li, Xiao, uh, gender difference, I use the word Bie, and Yu, friendship, Shou, uh, Sheng, Qi, another word I use for uh, equality, uh, may not be fully appropriate. And Zi Yu, Zheng, Jiao. So each chapter is an independent research article. And together, they cover 12 important concepts, categories in Confucianism. So they give a, a rough introduction of uh, the uh, general picture of Confucianism. So that, that is uh, what I do. And in each chapter, I try to apply to this uh, principle of progress humanity. And especially in the third section, <laughs> That is the socio-political reconstructions, where I discuss freedom in Confucianism, equality, and political philosophy, and education. And uh, these four chapters, uh, in comparison with the other four chapters, perhaps uh, contain more progressive element there in comparison with early work, early chapters. Early chapter is also kind of progressive approach, uh, progressive inquiry, but they, are, um, uh, they, they, they carry uh, quite a big dose of historical approach as well. <clears throat> and by the way, the book now uh, is online. If you check on uh, Oxford Academics website, there is a free chapter for those who are interested. You can go and click uh, download for free. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward for comments. I will stop sharing. Now. Hi, um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, yes, so we are we have 45 more minutes, um, which means that there should be plenty of times for commentators to comment and for Professor Lee to respond um, to each of the commentators. Um, so first up, I think we have Stephen Engel. That's the, that's the first. Um, and um, Stephen Engel, he's a professor of philosophy at East Asian uh, and East Asian studies, um, professor at Wesleyan University. Um, he does Chinese philosophy, Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism, um, comparative philosophy. I think he's also involved in the philosophy as a way of life project, um, which has been very interesting. Um, he has published many books and many articles. Of course, I thought I'll just highlight two, um, which have been cited in Professor Lee's book, uh, Professor Engel 
Kaiser is the author of Contemporary Confucian Political Philosophy to, Toward Progressive Confucianism and Growing Moral, A Confucian Guide to Life. Um, so please uh, go for it. And I promise not to police um, the length of your comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Saying and uh, uh, and Chen Yang for um, those uh, really interesting comments and and writing a wonderful book uh, that has uh, brought us together um, this morning or evening or wherever whatever time it is wherever wherever you are. Um, uh, it's it's great to be here. Um, I think that I want to start by uh, uh, joining in and encouraging everybody who has not. Uh, um, uh, read this book to 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 get a copy uh, to dig in. It's very rich. Um, uh, I think every one of the chapters uh, it makes a, a, a significant, interesting, provocative kind of contribution. Um, uh, and uh, so it's it's uh, it's an important uh, book. That it's so. I'm glad we're having this conversation. I'm sure there will be there will be many more um, uh, since. Uh, Chen Yang, you've focused on methodological issues, really, in your in your comments. I, I'll I'll do the same um, and 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 raise I don't know three or four kind of questions um, uh, that have to do with with uh, um, what you've just been talking about in the way that you arrive at the at the positions that you articulate in the in the twelve different chapters uh, of the book. Um, so first of all, uh, on the idea of philosophical reconstruction, um, and I think that the the distinction uh, that you're that you're making, I think, is an important one, um, and I think it's also the case uh, that for reasons partly that you you uh, you talked about. That a that we should not expect a sort of convergence on a single answer in philosophical reconstruction. Um, one reason for that maybe is that the uh, the evident ev sorry the evidentiary base um, that we're drawing on in Confucianism is so broad, so diverse, um, uh, and so it seems like if you there are different answers that we might get depending on. Um, uh, sort of which point in the tradition uh, we anchor ourselves to. Um, in your chapter on uh, on Xiao, uh, you uh, present a sort of a developmental view within the Confucian tradition itself, um, uh, right? And that so that leads in the uh, in the direction of a more well progressive way to think about uh, uh, about Xiao. But somebody who wants to anchor themselves more to the analects might arrive at a, a, a different view, perhaps. So I think that that all makes sense. Um, I guess what I wanted to, to question uh, is um, what, the, what the standard of success is um, when we're doing a philosophical reconstruction. Um, and you what you said in your in your comments just now, uh, uh, you said at one point that it's what we would identify as plausible today, right? Um, uh, and your example of the reconstructing an ancient house in a historical way as versus re reconstructing an ancient house in a philosophical way, um, uh, I couldn't decide whether the a successful philosophical reconstruction of a house is an objective or subjective uh, matter. Um, I was thinking it would be objective, right? Because you were saying if there's some if there's no some flaw in the house, well, then the historians might want us to reconstruct it in a way that's faithful to that flaw. Um, but the philosophers, they want what's plausible, what's attractive, what makes sense to us today. So we would we would fix the flaw. Um, uh, your example, and maybe this speaks to your situatedness in Singapore. Your example was air conditioning, um, uh, and 
you know, maybe that's objectively the right answer in, you know, a certain climate uh, that it's, it's difficult for humans to live comfortably without air conditioning. Um, uh, but it's interesting, right? I mean, one might think that, uh, well, there's other answers um, uh, and, and maybe uh, in a world of, you know, concern with climate change and, uh, and so on, we should try for um, redesigning the house in a way so that there's better airflow through it or something like that instead of, um, uh, instead of air conditioning. So, um, so the, the, the first question is, is wondering, um, whether, how you would answer that. Is it, is it, uh, is there one objective standpoint from which we today find things plausible? Um, uh, or are there multiple ones? Uh, and part two of that, for, of this first question, uh, is, um, is whether you see your answer to that question as different from uh, what I would call a rooted global approach, um, uh, where there's a the rootedness in in this case Confucianism is saying not just that we are uh, work working from the, these texts to interpret them but that the tradition itself provides the conditions of success. Um, uh, and so the this might make it in a certain sense more objective, um, uh, but, or at any rate, less up for debate. Um, uh, if the standards are the standards of the evolving tradition itself. Um, now, as you point out, and I totally agree with this, Confucians don't all agree. And so what the standards of success within the tradition today are is, is something that uh, uh, on which there's ongoing debate. But at least it seems like if what a progressive Confucian today, uh, what, what counts as a, as a successful progressive development of Confucian today is something uh, that we can understand in terms of the developing Confucian tradition itself, then that feels like it gives us more clarity uh, in terms of what the standards are, um, as opposed to what seemed like a very open-ended kind of plausibility um, uh, that you were talking about. So I wonder if you could could talk about that. Um, a second point uh, is, well, let me let me actually put two things together. So one thing that I wonder about is, you know, you said uh, right at the beginning that you're largely engaged with Anglophone philosophy and Anglophone philosophers here and and, uh, and scholars. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, about that, about why. Um, uh, obviously, there's a significant discourse in Chinese about what Confucianism uh, is and means today, not just historians talking about what Confucianism once was, um, but there are efforts to reconstruct Confucianism um, uh, taking place uh, within the Chinese language in a variety of different contexts, right? So in the mainland, um, uh, in, 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 uh, in Taiwan, um, uh, for example, right? So we have this so-called these days, you know, the Gantai Xin Wu Jia, uh, as opposed to the Dalu Xin Wu Jia, um, and other sorts of configurations. Um, so I wonder if you've thought about the way in which your approach to reconstructing Confucianism and progressive Confucianism might uh, uh, might relate to those sorts of projects, whether that's just a separate, a different thing than what you're doing or whether there's a similarity. And the part two of this question uh, has to do with for many of the Sinophone developers of Confucianism, the status of Confucian texts is not just um, like some old book that we are trying to understand, but it has a certain special value, right? Calling a text a jing, a, 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 you know, a, a classic or scripture or something uh, assigns to it um, some kind of special value. What that is, is, uh, you know, much debated. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that you're, 
I'm I'm 100% in agreement with what you say about the fallibility of Confucians, about the difference between monotheistic traditions uh, and um, uh, and Confucianism. But yes, there's a difference, but how much difference there is, right? Um, uh, whether there has to be some very significant respect accorded to these, you know, the authors of these ancient classics, um, uh, or whether we can disagree with them just as comfortably as we disagree with one another today. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, so that, that again, that connects a little bit to th this idea of what, what the Confucian tradition is in relationship to uh, modern interpreters. Uh, and then my last uh, methodological question has to do with um, the uh, the emphasis that you put on progress. So the principle of progressive humanity. Um, uh, I, f <laughs> I wonder if you have thought about how you would respond to a postmodern critic, to someone who is skeptical about the enlightenment narrative of pro well progressive humanity um uh and who thinks that there are a variety of ways in which uh you know liberal sorts of institutions have have actually let the world down um uh and you know someone like that i i could imagine saying that there's a sort of a naive belief in pro in in progress that's coded into this idea of progressive humanity and uh wonder what your thoughts are about that. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the continuing conversation. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, Steve, um, uh, for all these uh, very insightful questions. And uh, over the years, I have learned a lot from you, uh, from your work. So my book is kind of inspired by much of your work. Uh, and uh, this, of course, posed a new question for me. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, writing books to me is a, a regrettable uh, practice. Often, only after the book has been printed, you realize, oh, I should have discussed this. I should have said that. I don't know if you have that experience, feeling or not. I do. Surely. Now, uh, let me briefly um, make a response. I need to think more about this. Uh, this is a large question. I need to think about it. And now, uh, the first one, uh, what is the standard of, su of success? Uh, whether uh, a successful reconstruction, uh, the success is objective or subjective? Um, I think perhaps we should avoid uh, making it, a, you know, like just objective or subjective. I think you mentioned, mentioned there is some kind of objective practice there for uh, philosophy to be successful. And um, uh, now when we talk about plausibility, certainly <laughs> there is a, a subjective uh, dimension of it. But I think what we consider plausible also is based on our world as it is, the way we understand it. So. Um, whether uh, a reconstruction is successful or not uh, in philosophy is more of, a, of whether you can uh, persuade people to agree with you and, uh, in a free you know, uh, environment, free discussion and discourse environment. Um, now that is not an absolutist approach. So say this, you know, most people could be wrong at a certain time. But to me, uh, if a sufficient number of people uh, think what I say is plausible and makes a sense, they agree with me, to me, that is a success. Even though I always have uh, people disagree and disagreement with opponents. I think that that's the nature of philosophy. So um, uh, also, uh, you know, on your rooted uh, globally, uh, is the philosophy. I think um, in different cultures, people may feel differently, uh, even today. Uh, certain, even in China today, people feel differently uh, on 
what kind of Confucianism is appropriate. Uh, I think that disagreement itself within a country and disagreement uh, of people from different countries, as long as they engage with one another, have the discussion going, I think that is a positive thing. Uh, in that way, I'm kind of uh, harmonizing that. So we move on. It's not something we said ahead of time. Let's keep going and see where we can go. In the meantime, we maintain our sanity, trying to challenge ourselves and each other about the reasonableness of our view. I think that is um, uh, kind of open-ended, as you kind of mentioned on that. Uh, so it's not, it's, there is a progress, but it's not totally teleological set in stone. And it's a process, more of a process, like we are doing now, is part of it, I think. Now the second question um, is uh, uh, about uh, different audiences. We do Anglophone philosophy, and that's primarily my target audience, and also Chinese. And most people are doing Anglophone philosophy don't pay enough attention to what is going on in China. And in this regard, you are an exception, Steve. You are an exception. Uh, because again, also a lot of people are focused on ancient time rather than contemporary. Time. So they're focusing on ancient text. Um, but to me, um, I think there are two uh, ways to look at this. One is that uh, in the English-speaking world where I work and do my research, uh, the audience concern are not the same as that in China. In my, when I write in English, I try to be persuasive. I try not to turn people away. That is important for me. Unlike my, my people, my friends in China, they just assert this is the case. Yesterday I read an article, you know, Confucianism is Tian based, heaven based. Uh, that's it. And then uh, I think it's it very hard for me to sell that to my audience in the English speaking world. So I have to be mindful of that. And uh, I also acknowledge that my uh, reading of a contemporary Chinese work is not as uh, thorough as in English uh, literature. And uh, I just don't have that much energy to do all of it. We publish so much nowadays. I'm familiar with uh, a certain uh, new ideas, um, as you have been discussing in you know, Huang Yushun's and uh, Lin Anwu's and others as well. Um, so that's the primary uh, differentiation I make when I write. So my top primary target is English audience or Western audience. And uh, so that makes me uh, a little bit uneasy when the book is being translated in Chinese because the audience will be different. And also in, uh, in China, in the Chinese literature, people also have a different approaches as you were aware. And many people are uh, taking a historical approach. And recently, more and more people taking a more what I call a philosophical approach. And uh, I try to not take my position as one of these new uh, prefix Confucianism, Qian Zhui Ru Xue. I instead I try to articulate my view as a kind of a general orientation. So the kind of a progressiveness uh, orientation would include uh, different contemporary versions, uh, including your progressive Confucianism uh, and the paintings, uh, Gong Fu philosophy, Huang Yishun's Shenghua Ru Xue, and uh, Guo Ping's Zi Yu Ru Xue. Uh, I do not necessarily agree with all of this, but I think they, they share a common orientation that they are moving forward. They're not hiding themselves, locking themselves in the ancient time. And uh, so 
in other regard, I, I try to, to stay afloat of a particular uh, version of philosophy that I have. On the same time, let me very quickly. Uh, on uh, Chinese text, that's a very good question about my attitude towards uh, Chinese classics, the Jing. Um, I have to say that uh, I, um, I'm less uh, obedient than many my friends or, you know, submissive to ancient texts in that regard. Uh, I take these um, ancient thinkers as philosophers. Uh, the best way to me to respect a philosopher is to take their view seriously and engage with them. So when I uh, engage with a senior, you know, in the book, I, I criticize uh, Roger Ames quite a bit, even though I respect him a lot. And to me, that's the best way to respect him as a philosopher. And if I just say, okay, you are well known, you're well established, okay, well, that's what you says, and then I move on, ignoring your view. I take that to be a form of disrespect as a philosopher. A philosopher. Therefore, when I read classical text, I take ancient philosophers seriously and I engage them. When I don't agree with them, I engage them. And I engage them with respect. To me, that's a better form of respect than just say, well, that's it, without thinking, reflecting on what I said. To me, that is not taking them seriously as a philosopher. And as I, you know, sometimes tell my students, if you don't think hard on my view, trying to disagree, you are not really respecting your teacher. I, I think that that's my view on that. Uh, now, last point of postmodern. I don't have a solution to that. I find it very difficult to engage them and to have formal argument to, to reason with them. And um, I have no solution to that. And I can only say that uh, for me, progressive means does not mean there is a, a fixed ultimate goal, preset, predetermined. This is well discussed in my first chapter on harmony. And uh, nevertheless, there is a progress. And uh, I think that is true if you look at our society today. That's how we handle the big progress. That's all I can say. I cannot refute postmodernism. And but thank you so much. I, I need to think more about this. Question. All right. Um, on that note, I think we should move us along to our second commentator, um, Pei Min Ni, who is a professor at Grand Valley State University. Um, his research interest is, of course, Chinese philosophy and comparative philosophy, along with modern European philosophy, philosophy of causation, and an interestingly distinct Distinctively, uh, distinctive Kung Fu philosophy, um, which um, comes up in his most recent book, Understanding the Analects of Confucius, which features an artistic interpretation of Confucius' thought best understood in line with his Kung Fu philosophy. Um, all right, so take it away. And I will try not to please, but I want to be mindful of the time because we want to end at 10.30 sharp in Beijing time. Um, so yeah. Hey, thank you, Shaiing. And thank you for uh, Paul for providing this platform for us to have some conversation. And I'm uh, an admirer of Chen Yang's scholarship and I appreciate his points uh, very much. You know, today he began with a distinction about the historical approach and the philosophical approach. And indeed, this is a very important point and it points to a big problem uh, in mainland China's uh, scholarship on Chinese philosophy, because most people, when they talk about Confucianism, they, they just have in mind the historical Confucius. So um, when my recent book came out and uh, there was a, a symposium on that book, many critiques uh, were criticizing that I was not faithful to the classic Confucian texts. Um, 
I stretched the concepts, I, I dissolved uh, some dimension of Confuci classic Confucianism they think to be uh, essential. And uh, they, they uh, some of them blamed me for not surveying uh, the literatures, right? And Chen Yang was <laughs> the one who stood out and uh, defended me saying that, you know, what Pei Ming was doing was doing philosophy, not doing history of philosophy. So, of course, uh, if the history is involved, but my primary purpose was was reconstructing Confucianism. So I, I really appreciate that point. I, I think Chen Yang knows me uh, better than, than many other uh, friends that do. And then today I want to uh, push forward to some uh, discussion about the term progressive. Progressive is a, is a term that, as Chen Yang says, is descriptive term. Uh, it's not a proper name. Um, so progressive humanity is not a proper name for naming his own philosophy, but a descriptive term about the, the orientation that he's taking. That's I, how I understand. And in that sense, uh, not only Chen Yang, not only uh, Stephen and um, uh, myself uh, included, and many others, like uh, uh, Tu Weiming's uh, theory about the third epoch of Confucianism is progressive, right? Uh, moving to the contemporary age, and Li Zhehou's fourth uh, epoch is similar. And Ames and Rosemont, uh, their version of Confucianism uh, can be classified as progressive as well, and so does Huang Yusen, Su Guo, uh, Guo Ping's, like Chen Yang just met, mentioned. But then, uh, this then leads to one question that I have uh, about uh, Chen Yang's own theory. Now, how would you uh, characterize your own major contribution to Confucian scholarship? Uh, it's not just generally progressive, which is shared by many others. Uh, what is unique about you? I know. Harmony is, is a key concept that you, you worked on and developed. Uh, can we say that you develop a version of Confucianism that's harmony Confucianism? Would that be appropriate? Um, so that's one question. And the second, it's, uh, I, I don't think it's just a question. It's more like a comment. Uh, when when Stephen uh, raised the question about the postmodernism, I think my this comment can even be a response to Stephen's that question. Uh, so Chen Yang, let me <laughs> answer that question for you, maybe, uh, because the the term progressive can have two meanings. One is in terms of time. The time goes on. It's progress from ancient to modern and to future. Um, and another sense is progress means uh, getting better. Okay, so it's just like uh, the, the term age, age uh, can have two meanings. One is in terms of time, we are all getting older, right? Um, there's no going back, so we are progressing in terms of age, we are all getting older. But in another sense that uh, it's, you, 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 you feel younger, that's also possible as time goes on, right? In terms of better, your, your health improved. Uh, so now I think by progress, you mean the second sense that's getting better. So, what is modern is not necessarily better. Um, this leads to one uh, commentator uh, about my own work. And his, uh, his comment was uh, that uh, along with the progress of the, uh, the society, of a way of life in the modern age, Confucianism needs to change and need to change according to the progress of the, the time. Uh, so now nowadays, uh, he believes that the subjectivity is, is no longer like a family, not a community, 
but individuals. So modern Confucianism need to rebuild this in re, uh, construct, not rebuild, construct this individual subjectivity to suit to fit the modern progression of the uh, way of life. But if we understand progress in terms of the notion of better, then whether we progress to an individual subjectivity or not is not just a Confucianism need to, to change to fit the modern way of life. Maybe modern way of life needs to fit Confucianism, right? Uh, so here, uh, come back to the question of a postmodernism. Postmodernism has a lot of good points about the critique the, in their critique of modernity, right? And we can draw from classic Confucianism to respond to these critiques and say, hey, you, 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 your critiques are mostly deconstructed. Here are some constructive resources that we can provide. Uh, so. Now, in terms of question, I, I want to ask you, Chen Yang, if you, you agree with my interpretation or not, uh, which is progress understood in terms of time, uh, uh, in terms of betterment rather than time. I think due to the time limit, I, I better stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pei Min. Thank you for your comments. Uh, uh, start with the second one. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, progressive uh, implies getting better, not only in terms of time progression. Um, I also think that, uh, uh, to me, getting better means uh, keeping up with the change uh, and the evolution of society. As society evolves, and the Confucianism go with it. Now, as you mentioned, uh, there is another dimension that Confucianism can affect how society evolves. Confucianism is not merely a passive regard, but they work together. Uh, so that's also explain why the ancient version of Confucianism is no longer adequate today because society has changed. So I agree with you. Now back to my work, I don't have uh, an overall view of my personal version of Confucianism. Uh, I find it difficult to summarize. I think you are right. Harmony is a key term in my approach. I hesitate, however, to call it a harmony philosophy. The other word has you know, bad connotation as well. And also there are uh, elements of my work that are not directly linked to harmony. So uh, harmony plays a large role in throughout the book, uh, but I don't think I can call it a harmony philosophy. In each chapter I try to, I think this has to do with my analytical philosophy training. In each chapter I focus on one issue and trying to make the best of that issue. And uh, without the making all chap 12 chapters to fit into one model that would make it coherent uh, for, for labeling it one general terms. Um, yeah, I think that's that, that's where we are. I'm uh, Thank you. I, I, yeah, thank you so much for this comment. Thank you. Um, all right, so we are doing good on time and we will move along to our third commentator, um, Cindy Morrow, who is a prof assistant professor at the University of Central Oklahoma. Her research interests include pre-Tin and Han Chinese philosophy, as well as 20th century Chinese philosophy, uh, but also applied and place-based philosophy and comparative cross-cultural philosophy. Um, she has published many articles, book chapters, book reviews, edited volumes, uh, which span many interesting topics and areas of philosophy. Um, I thought I would highlight a few juicy ones. Um, just the most recent ones, finding the joy of far-flung friends, extending oneself through terrestrial, metaphysical, and moral geographies, um, and also men tell me 
paternalism is good, <laughs> which I found very funny. Um, and Confucian roles, are Confucian roles gendered? Um, so yes, take it away. I do want to be mindful. Again, I won't police, but I do want to be mindful of ending at 10.30. Okay, I'll be careful. Um, yes, so I was just uh, rereading today the Arc Confucian roles gendered paper um, in preparation. I think that we arrive at the lot, a lot of the same conclusions. So I prepared two questions. We'll only have time for one, so you don't get the option to pass. I was going to offer you that, um, but now you don't. So oopsies, um, we'll start here. Um, so I read your book and loved it. I love that it plays your greatest hits, like everything I've loved through all the years. In fact, I should say, um, I love all of your greatest hits. I don't know why I get to sit at the adult table today, but I'm really excited about it. Um, but this one, this section um, stuck out the most. Um, so I wanna go through, I'm nervous about the time. Let's see here. Um, all right, so just run everyone through the arguments. I read this uh, little teeny tiny section, in my opinion, <laughs> um, several times today. And uh, and I think that you're right. Of course, you're right. Um, you're a Professor Chin Lee. Um, so you, the first thing you say is that the spousal relationship is um, indispensable um, to Confucian philosophy, and that it is. Um, do you say uh, primary, canonical? Um, I have it read over here. Uh, um, it, that it, uh, according to some sources you know, grounds all of the relationships, extremely important. That's where we start. And then we get to the villain in the story, right? Dong Zhongshu. <laughs> and uh, part of your progressive vision is that we shelve that um, everything that uh, he managed to install in the tradition can maybe be pried out, put aside, and we can come to a more progressive view of gender. And we do this um, by applying a yin-yang framework. And this is how you spend the majority of that chapter. So I've outlined what I think are the important points in my own words, and I'll go through them right quick. Um, the first we find in several works on this topic, notably uh, Robin Wong and her book makes this point um, in a lot of different ways, which you um, dutifully cite, which is great, um, that uh, yin-yang are complementary but not essentialized. Um, that it doesn't go along any sort of binaries um, or have a superior, inferior, static dimension to it. So if we don't find this in yin-yang theory, um, contextualized then or now, then we can't very well apply it to the spousal relationship, that that was infelicitous on even Dong Zhang Shu's part. So we can start to, we can find the seam and start prying apart um, these uh, sexist, misogynistic theories from their, you know, their yin yang foundation. But then you go on to um, elaborate on what arrives at your um, particular and unique point. Um, individuals potentially have yin yang qualities that take shape within unique and contextualized relationship. You make the uh, point that you know we're not talking about yin people and yang people. Um, that yin and yang don't make sense unless they're um, they find their complement within the context of a relationship. So they aren't expressed otherwise. They aren't qualities of individuals. And then on to the third point, that within the context of a relationship, a person can have a yin leaning role um, in, you know, in one relationship in which that quality is expressed, um, as well as they can have a yang leaning role in another. That, um, you know, women being yin, yin, yin in, our, this, in all the relationships don't make sense in terms of sisters, like they can find complementarity too. Um, we just have to find, you know, the, the dynamic harmony that would structure, maintain, and, you know, sort of like coalesce in a relationship um, to make and continue a relationship. And that has each relationship potentially would have a yin yang dynamic. Okay. And then fourth, that a person um, in a relationship, two individual people in a relationship can each have yin informed roles and yang informed roles. Um, you know, like men can cook and women can have jobs and all of these things, like things that would be um, characterized on like the problematic, as you say, nay, why distinction um, can be rejiggered, reoriented, reorganized um, to suit the personalities of the people. And as you mentioned, the efficiency of a relationship, like uh, potentially that, you know, delineating um, 
gender roles on the basis of something like Nei or a strictly hierarchicalized yin yang um, wouldn't be efficient in the modern day. It was an agrarian underpopulated China, <laughs> but it certainly um, doesn't work today. So in the context of a spousal relationship, um, you know, these you know, individual particular characters finding their way toward a beneficial, harmonious relationship would carve out yin and yang features. What I've done here, though, except for my women can have jobs joke, is I have neutered all the language. You'll notice, like, this is what, this is what I do. This feels progressive to me. But you make the point, Professor Lee, that we don't want to degender. Um, that we need to maintain a theory of gender, of femininity and masculinity in order to be felicitous to the Confucian tradition. It's part of the foundation of Confucianism that roles be gendered. And you point to specific biological um, assigned sex themes to reorient each of these points that I've mentioned um, in a gendered way. So uh, running through these just right quick to get to BS, I'm not going to read to because that's what I just did. Uh, spousal relationships are gendered and you make some very good points for how they're not inferiorizing, dominant, misogynist, that it's totally possible. And you use this to inform your uh, vocabulary for BIA as differentiated differentiation, which isn't at all hard to read over and over again, <laughs> <laughs> to delink the exclusive wife and husband yang connections. Good. Then, here's why I never get invited to the adults table again. Um, so this is my reaction when I read a sentence like this. <laughs> Women in a gendered sense, um, woman in a gendered sense does not have to disappear altogether to achieve gender equality. This is the argument for how we can't do away with gender altogether and be just persons, right? And then you begin. <laughs> Take child rearing as an example, which makes me like, oh, like any time we talk about pregnancy and childbirth, I don't have, I pushed out two kids, sorry, overshare. Um, I don't have warm, fuzzy, loving, nurturing feelings about it. I have, a, I have, I have relationships with them now that are good, but that's not, I don't think by virtue of having suffered pregnancy. I mean, experienced. <laughs> so when I hear something like this, I think I found a line a line that I'm willing to cross, but I'm not sure you are. So here we go. Here comes my question. Let's play a game. <laughs> my game show is how progressive are we really? <laughs> oh, I wish like someone would unmute and laugh. This is making me nervous. <laughs> um, okay, so there's me. Oh no, my speech, but okay, there's. Um, so it's time for the game. There's only one question. What is the focus of your theory of differentiated differentiation. I intend to use be as a verb. So here are your two, there's only one question in the game. Here it is. Um, a, the focus is, and I'm using be as a verb again, yin yang features of conventional gender roles as assigned sex informed predispositions. So assigned sex um, in your book, biological sex um, that are bid in the context of unique and lived relationships is one option. The second is that your being yin yang features of role related persons to inform conventional gender roles. This is nitpicky and I know it, but I think that um, it makes a huge difference. Um, note, you know, the 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 relationship is different. I mean, I'm saying it's not a transverse relationship, so there has to be a directionality to it. Are we starting with conventional gender roles and progressing toward um, remonstrated gender roles? Or are we starting with persons and the relationship with they share and the, as I said, like rejigger all of that sort of organization to make the relationship efficient? And then from then we can discuss gender roles of husband and wife. Um, so are we willing to cut ties with a conventional role sedimentation and switch toward this idea of completely embracing a yin yang structure and using that to inform what would be progressive gender roles? Let me know if that question makes sense. And, um, and I'd love to know what you think. Um, we don't have time for you to pass. In fact, we're out of time. So sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you for that uh, comment and question. It is important uh, 
chapter, but a difficult chapter, and I anticipate uh, controversy on the chapter. I can see people <laughs> may uh, attack the position from both directions. Uh, some will think it's not progressive enough, others think you are, have gone too far. So uh, back to your question, the idea of a differentiated differentiation is the belief that believing in Confucian idea of a harmony uh, on the basis of a yin-yang relationship. And I still embrace the idea in order for there to be harmony within the uh, spousal relationship, there should be a difference. However, the difference is not essentialist. It's not like a traditional view that women, you know, Feminine, feminine way and you know, masculine way. I think each uh, person, as you characterize it, uh, has both yin and yang. And uh, uh, in a particular couple, uh, they play different roles. I think the bottom line is there has to be differentiation. And that differentiation can be differentiated in that in your relationship, uh, it may be configured a way different from my relationship and my family. And as long as they are differentiated, uh, there is you know, a condition for harmony. That's a point I think I want to make. Now, um, the idea of the biological fact, that I wanted to take that as outside of the philosophical idea itself. It is the observation of empirical fact that the women you know, having this nine months of pregnancy they mostly feel different, more intense, you know, about their baby than men. Uh, you can always find a counter example, the band large, that makes a difference. And uh, so in any general philosophy, when you apply it to specific cases, you have to consider the specific situation. And uh, the general situation, my belief is that uh, the women and those, you know, mothers, they do feel differently. They have a need different from men, you know, mostly, not universally. And another point is that in this chapter, I do not discuss the LGBT cases. I discuss the typical traditional family case. And this is an important question. I anticipate more discussion and more controversy. And I look forward to it. You are the first one to a comment on this chapter, as I anticipate many people will do. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So this is uh, the perfect time to end. So I think, um, can we, well, this is Zoom, but we'll like, we can imagine coming together and thanking our speaker and our commenters by clapping. Um, <laughs> and yeah, thank you so thank much you. for attending. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you uh, Sai Ying and everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, there's the Robert. <laughs> Good to see you. Okay, thank you so much. And, uh, Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, thank well, you. Good morning. Your side, yeah. It's good morning. Again, thanks, I really appreciate it. <laughs>